thanks for being here. Uh, let me do just a quick introduction and then we'll kind of get into, get into the presentation. So uh, I'm Yoji Shimizu, I'm a volunteer with uh, First Robotics. I've been volunteering since 2009, I think. And I primarily volunteering as a master of ceremonies for regional competitions. And I've also a mentor for uh, with primarily with team 1816, although I've worked with some other teams as well. And um, been involved with the program really since 2005 or 2006. So it's been a long experience for me. Um, and I'm also on the board of directors for First in the Upper Midwest. So this is the 501c3 that supports uh, the first robotics competitions in Minnesota, North Dakota, and South Dakota. And that program or that uh, organization has been around for uh, for a couple of years now. So um, okay. I'm going to, I've got a, some slides to share with you. We've got a small group, which is fine. And hopefully we can engage in a little bit of discussion here. But uh, let me get this going. Uh, every time I share slides in Zoom, I can't see like the chat and stuff like that. So please just feel free to kind of just unmute and um, ask your questions. And let's see why is this working? There we go. Okay. So um, I really wanted to, this presentation is really focused on issues about how to kind of foster team success um, by taking into account representation and kind of uh, being mindful about the climate in which you as a team are kind of operating. And um, really this is kind of focused on issues of, of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And uh, I know these can be kind of challenging topics to discuss. So I just want to kind of just remind everybody that, you know, we're here in a safe space space. We're here to kind of learn and uh, in order to have a kind of a learning environment here, just to be mindful about respecting each other and being engaged. And of course, always to have in mind gracious professionalism, which is, you know, a core foundational principle for, um, for FIRST Robotics. So um, I titled this sort of as representation and climate, but really this focuses on these issues of equity, diversity, and inclusion. And let me kind of define those terms and kind of tell you how I kind of view representation in that context, as well as in climate. So really when we're talking about representation, we're really talking about this concept of diversity, like this, this issue about who is actually at the table. So who is on your team, for example, who is uh, in the room, essentially, like, uh, uh, you know, are there a variety of identities and experiences and backgrounds within your team? Um, how does your team kind of feel about that? How representative, for example, is your team of the school or the community that you represent as part of the FIRST Robotics program? So that's kind of representation, kind of who's in the room. And when I think about climate, I really am thinking about what does the room feel like? And, um, and is there a sense of, of, of belonging and a sense of um, an environment in which everyone feels that they can participate and bring their authentic selves to the conversation. Oh, that sure. kind of climate is really kind of the key thing that um, I think really maximizes team success. And part of that is, so that's kind of the inclusion part. And then the other part is like, how does your team actually operate in terms of, is there sort of fair treatment and equality of opportunity um, access to information is that shared among all team members kind of act. That's sort of this issue about equity, sort of the process by which your team kind of um, moves through time and space. That's really what, what we're talking about in terms of climate. So that's part of this whole issue about climate is sort of this culture as well as sort of the processes and policies that are kind of in place within your team and how you operate. So why is this kind of an important topic for FIRST Robotics? Like for you know our robotics team, why do we even want to think about this? And, and FIRST is really quite interested in this topic and there are a number of reasons why. And let me kind of uh, maybe start with the first kind of just questions here, which is sort of um, the, and I'll stop sharing my screen here for, for a moment. So does anybody have a guess in terms of what the percentage of FIRST Robotics Competition students and mentors in the state of Minnesota who competed in 2020 how many of them identify as women? What's that percentage, do you think? You can put it in the chat or just kind of speak up since we have a small group here. Any ideas? I bet it's more than 50%. That identify as women for students and mentors. Okay, but more than 50%, okay. Anybody else? 
I was going to say, I was hoping it was at least 50%, but I, I was not hopeful that it would be. <laughs> okay, hoping for 50%. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a cynic. I put I put in the chat. It's probably about twenty five percent. Okay, enormously from participating in first robotics, uh, probably more than the guys do actually, um, in terms of their uh, persistence and their continuation into sort of STEM focused careers. So obviously, getting more representation and more diversity in the first community can be can have huge benefits. So. Um, so the other way, of course, that we can look at this is sort of um, thinking about the, um, the diversification of our population in terms of race and ethnicity, right? So the state of Minnesota, like many states in the country, is becoming much, much more diverse. And this is particularly true for the, the younger you look. So um, high school students, for example, um, in the state of Minnesota are in a community that is very, very diverse compared to old people like me, right? So, um, and this is this is continuing to show that the percentage of uh, students of color um, is increasing um, in the state of Minnesota. So there is a huge diversity that's increasing. And the question is, are we capturing and engaging that population of students in programs like FIRST Robotics? And the question is, and the answer is really not as much as we would like. Um, so when we look at, for example, comparing, the, again, the Minnesota FRC student population in 2020 that participated in the program compared to Minnesota 11th graders, you know, there's a reasonable representation of Asian Americans, but uh, Hispanics are underrepresented, African Americans, for example, are underrepresented, Native American and Alaska Natives, for example, are underrepresented compared to the 11th grade population in the state of Minnesota have used that as a, as a kind of a, a standard. And then if you look at the mentors, actually the mentors are even less well represented. So, um, and again, this is comparing the Minnesota FRC student population, which again is already a kind of underrepresented in some of these categories. There are very few, uh, the diversity of the mentor population is also very low compared to the, um, compared to the student population or the overall population. So that's also an issue I think that, that, uh, that and I think we're, you know, the FIRST program is really kind of focused on. And as a result, FIRST has really kind of been prioritizing initiatives, grants, resources for these underrepresented and vulnerable populations. So these include, you know, Hispanics and Latinos, African-Americans, American Natives, girls and young women, economically disadvantaged, first generation, LGBTQ positive uh, plus youth, et cetera, et cetera, right? So there's a lot of interest among the uh, program in terms of increasing that uh, that representation. So the key question for this is, of course, well, first is interested in this, but why is this even, you know, from your perspective as a team, you know, why should you even care about this? Why should this even be important? And um, I'm going to show you one video, which I think will hopefully get to this question, and it will be related to the the um, discussion that I think Sean Kelly had. Um, uh, a couple of weeks ago with about team decision making. So can you see this okay? I'm still like trying to figure out if this is working. Is this okay? Yeah, and you did you check the box to this um, to do audio for your I stream? think I did. I think I did. Okay. Let's try it. Okay, let's see what happens. Cognitive diversity consists of things like information, knowledge, heuristics, Oops. rules of thumb, causal models, right? frameworks. Identity diversity consists of things like race, gender, sexual orientation, religion, physical abilities, those sorts of things. And so when you think about how does identity diversity improve outcomes, it's through cognitive diversity. If I'm a 65-year-old white engineer and you're a 33-year-old African-American computer scientist, right, our training differences will matter, but so will the fact that we've filtered our lives through our identities. It's just going to change how we see things. So let's suppose we have a group of people sitting around a table and they're trying to come up with a creative solution to some problem. Well, if you think of 10 and I think of 10, but they're the same 10, then we're no better than, the two is no better than one. But if I only think of eight and you think of 10, but my eight are different than your 10, there's a bonus there, right? Because we're getting sort of my extra ideas. 
Where the second level bonus comes in is sometimes we can take your idea plus my idea and we can combine them, right? And create something new. So the idea is to shift people's frame of reference, to move away from who's the smartest person and instead think who are the people who have germane knowledge and then that might be able to add to our solution here. Some of the places that have surprised me the most in terms of where I think they've really leveraged diversity to achieve bonuses are like hospital emergency rooms. They may send an entire ensemble of doctors trained from different schools all to look at you because they can recognize that it's complex. And when it is, they throw diversity at it. We live in an age of uncertainty. Scott's book actually begins to outline perhaps one of the core issues for us to confront through a series of tests, through examinations, and finds in multiple settings. The more complicated the problem, the better solution that comes from having diverse teams of actors working on solutions. That's more important to me than, now than at any time uh, in the last 200 years in American history. Okay, so that's kind of the, the crux of this question about, um, you know, who's at the table, right? And, and from the perspective of FIRST Robotics, what I always think about is when the build season, like when the game is revealed, kind of teams do a lot of brainstorming. And that's where all these ideas come in. And that's where I think about that table in the video, like who is at the table, who's contributing these ideas, if you have people with different backgrounds and experiences or students with different backgrounds and experiences at that table, the likelihood is that you'll have more creative ideas that come out of that kind of uh, that build process and hopefully more creative and interesting robots that come out, come out of that process as well. So that's kind of um, what we're kind of thinking about here in terms of why that representation could be a benefit to a first robotics team, right? Now, there are lots of examples of kind of impacts, negative impacts of not having that kind of representation in STEM. And I'm only gonna show you this one article from the New York Times, which talks about artificial intelligence. And the fact that we are using artificial intelligence to create self-driving cars, to create uh, robots that will um, replace people in highly dangerous kinds of situations. And the algorithms that are being developed in artificial intelligence, unfortunately, actually aren't working that well. Uh, that you know, many of these algorithms actually end up biasing against people of color. And this relates to the fact that most of the people that are developing these artificial intelligence algorithms are white and male, as we've seen with the engineering kind of uh, workforce. So, um, so again, the diversity that's lacking in that room as people are developing these algorithms is impacting the way the algorithms are being developed and um, having kind of these negative effects. And there are many, many other examples that exist in the engineering field, as well as in medicine and science that suggest that again, this lack of representation can be quite harmful and in many cases actually quite deadly for, uh, for uh, people in our community. So, um, so that's another reason I think why it's important to kind of be thinking about this. Um, the other reason is that FIRST is also kind of, again, uh, focused on this. And, and there have been some changes recently that I think teams should kind of be aware of. Um, there's been some discussion over the past year or so through social media about um, instances of students on FIRST Robotics teams who have encountered bias and discrimination and harassment, in, unfortunately, in our program. So this question about how much are we kind of really thinking about making an inclusive and welcoming and equitable climate is something that, uh, that is on um, certainly on our minds. And then uh, the Chairman's Award, which is you know the highest award that's offered in uh, FIRST Robotics. Um, there is a new kind of executive summary question in that, uh, in that award process, which happened last year, where the teams now will need to actually describe efforts in the past three years to promote equity, diversity, and inclusion within your team first and uh, your communities. So again, they're really asking all teams to begin to think about this and think about the impact of uh, representation and climate and kind of what, uh, what teams are kind of doing to hopefully address that. Um, the other thing that's become noticeable is that sponsors of FRC teams are also 
much more interested in this question than they used to be. And there are lots of reasons why sponsors or companies might be interested in this. One is kind of the whole issue of the, the, the workforce is diversifying, right? And so um, future employees of companies are much more diverse than they used to be. And of course, companies need to respond to that and create um, climates that are uh, inclusive and equitable for a more diverse range of employees and give them uh, opportunities to succeed um, in order to kind of grow and develop their workforce. Um, so you will see now with regard to grant opportunities that exist in FIRST Robotics, uh, more expectations about teams having a commitment to representation, climate, equity, diversity, inclusion for the teams that they sponsor, right? So um, this is one example of a grant from Abbott where um, there is very specific language about looking or, or interested in sponsoring teams who serve underserved, underrepresented and vulnerable students at first is prioritized. Um, and I think you're going to see more of these kinds of expectations that come from, uh, come from uh, companies and sponsors of FRC teams. And, and I think that's true for Medtronic in terms of their, uh, their work with FIRST Robotics moving forward as well. So there are lots of different reasons why this is, this is an important topic to consider. Um, and so how can teams kind of begin to kind of work on this and, and focus on this? So um, one is that there are resources available. So uh, FIRST has developed a, a number of really great uh, online training resources focused on equity, diversity, and inclusion. And um, they've encouraged teams to, uh, all team members and mentors to, to complete that training. Um, and that's freely available online for, for anybody to kind of complete and, uh, and reflect on. Um, it's obviously important to kind of model expected behavior and, and to call out kind of poor behavior. Um, and then when we talk about processes and kind of equity, like how, thinking carefully about all of your team activities, right? For example, how are you actually recruiting students to your program? Um, are you relying specifically on a smaller network of, of connections to bring in students? Or are you trying to do a little bit more outreach that goes beyond kind of the, the, uh, the network of people that you know? How are you kind of creating opportunities for students to be successful within your program once they're recruited? And the same is true for mentors. Like how are you recruiting those mentors? Who are you reaching out to? Um, uh, and uh, what are you doing to kind of support uh, a more diverse array of mentors as well? Processes that exist within the team, like for example, for leadership positions or the way in which you kind of do the robot build, um, all of those things can be thought about in terms of trying to figure out, are you making sure that all of the different voices on your team are being heard uh, appropriately um, and, and equitably? Um, and the overall team climate and the sense of belonging that exists within, uh, within the team. Um, I've noticed this, for example, in, in robot building, for example, this issue about um, introverted individuals versus extroverted individuals. How do you actually engage someone who's maybe more introverted in that build process, which typically is very time intensive and there's a lot of pressure to make decisions quickly. Some individuals don't do as well with that kind of approach. And so how can you think about ways in which to kind of engage those individuals in, in this really important kind of build process that exists as well. The other one that I'm particularly interested in because I see this all the time as a, as a volunteer is for example, the most visible um, positions on an FRC team at a competition are the individuals that are actually driving the robot. So the people that we call the drive team. So those are the people that are visible on the field. Everybody sees them, everybody's watching them. And for the most part, I would say they're probably not 27% women <laughs> on those drive teams at a competition. It's probably less than that. It's mostly guys that, that are kind of driving the robot. So that always is related to me kind of what is the process that any individual team is using to select who gets to be on the drive team. And uh, I've learned, in fact, that different teams are do, do different things. Some are sort of like it's just passed on to different team members kind of from year to year. Um, there's no kind of formal process by which that occurs. Um, I've learned of other teams that have tried to make this a little bit more equitable. They do kind of auditions. They actually do kind of a blinding process, which is similar to the way that um, orchestras have recently decided to do processes to select who joins. They put them behind a screen so they don't know if it's a man or a woman. Um, 
I, I know of one team in Minnesota who has been trying to do that, where basically they don't know who's driving the robot in the audition to try and uh, uh, eliminate some of the, reduce some of the biases that exist. I think other teams are also trying the process of letting everybody on the team drive the robot, whether they want to or not, because number one, it helps the entire team to understand what it means to drive the robot, what it's like, and the build process that can be helpful, but it also may allow students who are maybe a little bit more hesitant to say that they are interested in driving the robot to get that chance to do that, right? And I think that's particularly true for girls that they maybe are a little bit more hesitant to kind of think about being involved with something like driving the actual robot and being involved in the game competition. Um, so there are lots of different approaches that can be done. And I think it's important for, for teams to kind of think about how they can potentially do that um, as, uh, as a way to kind of make that process a little bit more equitable and give people more of an opportunity to kind of be involved in, in that particular aspect of things. So, um, then let me, let me also tell you, I think, about one other way in which I think it could be helpful for teams to, do, to, to kind of begin to talk about this, this issue. So, um, this one is, uh, let's see, hold on. Let me see if I can, I need to see you guys. So hold on, I'm gonna turn those off. And then, there we go. I think that'll be a little bit better. There we go. Okay. So um, how do you actually talk about this and kind of make it a, a normal prop part of your, uh, conversation on the team. And I want to introduce you to something that I learned from my work at the University of Minnesota. And this comes actually from the College of Science and Engineering. And it's something that they've called a diversity moment. Um, I'm just going to call it here an FRC EDI moment. This comes from their Diversity and Inclusivity Alliance. So in the College of, Sci College of Science and Engineering at the university now, at the start of every meeting, um, they are doing this, what they call a, a, a diversity moment. So this is like a one or two minute kind of activity, teaching or intervention that's centered specifically on equity, diversity, and inclusion. And the reason they're doing this is really to kind of promote this kind of culture of acceptance and belonging and respect and awareness. Um, to normalize these discussions and the language around equity, diversity, and inclusion to cultivate a receptive environment for conversations that can be quite challenging. Um, and to promote an opportunity to do some reflection and, and learning. And it's, again, not meant to cause any kind of emotional trauma or hurt, but it's really designed as an opportunity to kind of reflect and to continue to learn on a continuous basis. And so this can be a variety of different things. It can be sort of sharing current uh, news about uh, some aspect of, of representation and climate. It could be introducing a concept or an historical event or a practice. Um, creating some space for personal reflection, practicing change um, and allyship. Um, and at least in the College of Science and Engineering, apparently everybody is, is asked to do this or volunteered to do this um, at a meeting. And then the way in which this, this is done is typically, you know, most of our, our meetings are still kind of in this virtual format. There's a PowerPoint slide that's kind of put together. Um, they present their moment, share their level of familiarity with the concept and with the their level of comfort talking about these topics and then introduce that topic. It's not necessarily meant to kind of engage actively in kind of discussion, but it's sort of like, here's a, here's a topic, here's my moment, and just ask for you to kind of reflect on that. And then you'd move on to the rest of the topic. So in terms of like a team environment, it could be like at a team meeting, or for example, at the beginning of your team meeting, you would have somebody on the team kind of introduce one of these moments. And so I wanna show you actually a couple of examples. And these come actually from a colleague of mine, Sandy Olson, who's with, um, with uh, team 2502, Talon Robotics in Eden Prairie. She put a couple of these together and I put a couple of these together just to give you an example of what these could potentially look like if you were interested in doing this. So this is one of Sandy's slides, which is about the fact that there are all these resources that, are, that exist in the first community to help you with, um, with these discussions. So there's really no need to kind of recreate the wheel. There's this large training resources on equity, diversity, and inclusion. There's training for mentors as well as training for students. And um, it could, can seem a little overwhelming in terms of the, what's available, but it just, it's just a matter of watching a video and beginning to kind of 
uh, process the information that's presented in that video and beginning to discuss it. So this can be an entryway for our team, for example, to begin to have these kinds of discussions and think about this a little bit more carefully and, uh, and intentionally. Right? So that's an example of one kind of um, EDI moment. I'll show you this one. This is one of my examples. So this is, these are pictures of those drive teams that I talked about before. These are the students who are driving the robot. And this is actually from the 2019 Minnesota State High School League Robotics Tournament. And these are the uh, three, the two alliances, three teams apiece. And they are out here on the field being recognized before the big kind of finals matches. And um, the thing that I noticed about this particular year in 2019 was that there was really good representation of girls on the drive teams of both of these alliances that were competing for the state championship. If you look at this, it's at least 25% on both of these alliances were girls. Very, very unusual, actually. If you look at the year before in 2018, there were no girls on any of the drive teams for the finalists or the championship alliances or the state championship in robotics. So, you know, this is quite different, quite unusual. And um, the reason it kind of resonates with me is that um, I know that there's someone in the audience watching these events who's thinking that's a really cool thing that I would love to be able to do, but I don't see any girls involved in robotics or if they're not really kind of going into the pits and talking to teams, they're gonna say, but that doesn't look like something that I could do because it's not very representative of what's, of what's going on. So when you see this kind of happening, um, I think it's important to kind of remember as a team, one of your goals as a team is to kind of inspire other people, particularly younger people, to get involved with robotics and to get excited about STEM. And whether you, whether you understand it or not, there's someone in that audience who's looking at these drive teams and saying, I can do this, or maybe the message is I can't do this, right? And so in this case, actually that representation equates to inspiration for a lot of these younger people that are in that audience watching these competitions. And so that for me is like, I was really excited sort of seeing this particular kind of year in terms of how much better it was, I think in terms of providing that source of inspiration for lots of different people. Um, the third example is again, um, social media, for example. Uh, teams do a lot of social media activity. They're on Twitter, they're on Instagram. They're doing lots of different things to try and inspire people through social media with STEM and uh, engineering. And um, it is useful to kind of reflect on exactly what you're promoting and what you're discussing on social media, right? There's a lot of um, hashtags and organizations that have come up over the past year, like Black in STEM, First Like a Girl, Diversity in STEM. Um, so think carefully about how you're using social media in terms of promoting STEM and are you promoting representation in STEM and promoting a, a sense of belonging with the uh, social media activities that you use. So that's a third example. Here's the fourth one. This is another one from me. Um, so this one is actually, uh, I'll talk to you about one of my favorite uh, TV shows. So this is from the moon landing in 1969, right? Apollo 11. So for someone of my age, I was eight years old when this happened. It was hugely inspirational to me, um, but, it was, again, if you looked at the astronauts and you looked at kind of the people that were in mission control, all white men, essentially. So at that same time, there was another vision of space travel that was being, uh, that I saw, which was actually this one from Star Trek, right? Exact same time, 1967 to 69 was when this show was on the air. And uh, this was a very different vision of, of space travel, right? Much more diverse. There was a person who looked like me, an Asian person, there was a black woman, there was a literal alien on the, on the crew, there was a Russian. It was really kind of an interesting kind of um, uh, difference. And it was a core principle of the Star Trek franchise actually that this uh, diversity was really important. And to give you a sense again about the importance of representation and how it can inspire people, um, this is Mae Jemison who is I believe the first African-American female astronaut in NASA. 
And she appeared on a later version of Star Trek. And the reason that she did was she said she was inspired by this representation here, Michelle Nichols, who was Lieutenant Uhura in the original Star Trek series. She actually went on to recruit for NASA to diversify the astronaut space force in NASA. And what I later learned in fact was um, she was thinking about leaving the show after about a year. And she was told, she was asked specifically by Martin Luther King Jr. to stay on the show because it was one of the only representations of black people in, on television that really reflected kind of who they are and their authentic selves. And so because of that, actually, she stayed on the show. She became a fixture on that show. And I ultimately ended up to do this kind of recruitment for NASA, which ultimately ended up with people like Mae Jemison becoming part of the astronaut force. So again, this is a historical example of kind of the importance of representation in terms of inspiring people to see a path and see a career that maybe they hadn't thought about before. So that's kind of these EDI moments. These are things that I think teams could do if they were interested in kind of working on this kind of approach to begin to kind of have these kinds of conversations and to think about this as well. So finally, in terms of resources, I think I'm just going to mention the fact that FIRST again has lots of these kinds of resources available through their website, firstinspires.org. Um, locally, our first in the upper Midwest, you know, our 501c3, we have a website called firstuppermidwest.org. We do have a diversity and inclusion committee, and we're always looking for committee members. We have some funding opportunities for teams to kind of uh, begin to work on things that they may be interested in, in terms of increasing representation or increasing uh, uh, working on program uh, team climate, for example. There are other FRC teams that are doing uh, a lot of interesting and great work in this area. And uh, you know, FIRST is all about collaboration and teamwork. Um, so those are other great resources as well. Your school obviously is another great resource. And there are these other support organizations and affinity groups that exist within the FIRST community, like LGBTQ plus of FIRST and FIRST Ladies, other ones that are kind of national efforts that um, some of our local teams have gotten involved in and engaged with um, that can be helpful as well. Right, so there's lots of resources out there to kind of be, to, to work on this and to kind of um, uh, hopefully uh, help your team be more successful as it moves forward with, uh, with the upcoming competition season and future seasons as well. And finally, the last kind of resource that I wanna mention for you is that um, much of this kind of conversation is really focused on sort of, um, you know, your team mission and your kind of vision of what you would like your team to be. And ultimately that reflects on sort of your values that exist within your team. Like what's important to you as a team uh, moving forward. And so um, I have worked with a lot of different teams over the past couple of years on sort of helping them kind of define what, they, what we call kind of the core values. And this is again, a kind of a fun foundational principle within first robotics to uh, identify what those core values are. So for example, gracious professionalism is kind of a fundamental core value within, uh, within uh, uh, the first organization. Um, but uh, we, we've kind of developed a workshop uh, that allows within an hour and a half to two hours for teams to begin to kind of discuss this and think about it. And it is a, a way to kind of uh, promote a common understanding of what kind of team behavior and team climate is, supposed, is, is uh, you're kind of striving for as a team. So, um, so we have worked with a lot of different teams, both in person and virtually. These are kind of pictures of some of the workshops that we've held over the past couple of years. And I will tell you that high school students take this really, really seriously. I mean, I've done this kind of activity with organizations like at the university, and I will tell you that high school students take this much more seriously than some of the other groups that I've worked with. They, they really are thinking a lot about kind of What's important to me? What's important to my team? What kind of environment do I wanna be a part of? Um, those are all really important questions for, uh, for teenagers. And, um, and this is a way for them to kind of engage in that process. So we've worked with all these different teams over the past couple of years, both locally, as well as some in other uh, regions of the country. And uh, we know that some teams have also done this independently. So uh, we have resources that can allow teams to do that as well. But all of this is on our website. The, uh, first at uppermidwest.org and, um, and I encourage you to kind of um, think about this if this is something that you're interested in doing. 
So that's pretty much it. I think I'm doing pretty well in terms of time. So um, this is my contact information. And if there's, uh, if you have any questions or things that you'd like to talk about, you know, please feel free to reach out and, uh, and, uh, and get in touch with me. So I think with that, I'm going to stop and kind of uh, leave it open for things that people might want to talk about. EOG, would you bring back up the slide that showed the hashtags for social media? Yeah, of course. Let's see. Um, hold on here. Let's see. This one? Is that the one, Michelle? Uh, yes, that one. Thank you. 